and welcome to another episode of Gone with the Gale. This time, I'm going back to Scotland. Yes, for the second time in seven months, I was lucky enough to get to go back to Scotland, one of my favorite places on the planet. A good friend of mine, Christy, won a trip to Scotland through the Ellen DeGeneres show. It was free airfare from anywhere in the United States, pretty much to anywhere in Canada or international in the UK. We chose Glasgow so that we could go back to Scotland. When she had told me about it, I jokingly said, I volunteer as tribute. And she said, okay, let's go. So we did. We took WestJet out of Orlando and went from Orlando to Toronto, Canada, to Halifax, Nova Scotia, to Glasgow. It was a fun trip, but there were lots of ups and downs and lots of craziness. So come with me when I tell you about my trip to Scotland. We got up early on that Friday morning and made our way towards Orlando. The weather was beautiful. It was sunny and hot. Typical Florida weather. We were lucky. We breezed through security. And of course, the first place I headed for was Starbucks. We've been going since early in the morning to get to Orlando on time. And I was glad for my Frappuccino. We hopped on a plane and headed for Toronto. We were lucky. I got the window seat and it was a nice flight. It only took a little over two and a half hours to get to Toronto. I took this from the plane as we were getting ready to land. That's the CN Tower off in the distance. Little did we know the craziness that would occur in Toronto and how it would change the first few days of our trip. With what happened next, you would have thought we traveled to Toronto this way. Toronto was our first point of entry into Canada. And through the rules, we needed to pick our luggage up off the luggage carousel and take it to what they call the transfer belt, basically proving that we had made the trip with our luggage. They check your passport yet again, they put it on a belt, and they put it on to the next plane. Well, that didn't quite happen. We waited over a half an hour, almost 45 minutes, for our luggage to come down the carousel, and it never did. We found a WestJet employee who looked at our luggage tickets and said, Oh, no, for you, your luggage has already been put on the transfer to Glasgow. While that was totally contradictory to what we were to told on the plane, we decided we'd trust her. I mean, there was no luggage left coming down the ca carousel, so she had to be right, right? So we went upstairs. But just to be safe, we went to the WestJet desk and asked not one, but two people, one of which was the supervisor, whether the information we had been given in the luggage area was correct. And they said, yes. They looked at our tags and said they ha said Glasgow. So our bags would have been sent on without us. So we believed them. I mean, three employees had told us that our bags had been transferred for us. I didn't worry about this when we went through Dublin last year because they automatically transfer there with Aer Lingus. So unbeknownst to us, our bags would never make the flight. This is me eating my very first Tim Hortons. It was good, but I didn't know that my bag was sitting somewhere in the terminal, lost and lonely, never dreaming that it would never make it to Glasgow with me. We got on the next flight. The flight crew, Patricia and Jason, were two of the most amazing flight attendants I'd ever had. They were hilarious. They treated us like royalty, and they were great. We flew to into Halifax, then on through the night to Glasgow. This is us the next morning as we were waiting to be processed through immigration. We were happy. We didn't know our luggage was missing. We also knew that Steve from Outlandish Journeys was waiting for us on the other side. I had texted him. We were so excited to start our trip with him and tour many of the Outlander sites as soon as we were through security. But our happiness was short-lived. Once we passed through security, we walked over to the baggage claim, and there was only one bag going around. We waited, thinking maybe, because we were the last people off the plane, that maybe, just maybe, it was on the other side of the belt. We waited and watched the same single lonely bag go around three times before we realized our baggage wasn't coming. God loves Steve. He waited for us while we were taken by security to the luggage claim office. We spent an hour there filling out paperwork and making claims so that we may eventually find our bags. 
they did eventually find them. Well, they found Christie's bag. It was still in Toronto. It had never made the flight. It had never come down the belt, so it was probably sitting somewhere in a back room, never loaded onto our flight. They did not, however, find my bag, though they supposed that my bag was the one that was taped to Christie's because Christie's bag had a note on it, two bags. But since it hadn't been scanned, they couldn't tell me it was mine for sure. And with that, Steve picked us up and we were off. First stop on our tour today was Ward Park Studios in Cumbernauld. It's where the TV show Outlander is filmed. It had doubled in size and been repainted since I was here in the fall. I'll put a link to that video here. It's amazing, the power of Outlander and how it's created jobs and enlarged the studios. Here's a picture of me last fall. Look at the difference in the weather, cold and rainy versus sunny and hot. Yes, hot. It was actually in the 70s. It's the hottest weather I've experienced in Scotland. Our next stop was Dune Castle, known as Castle Leoch from Outlander. What a difference sunshine makes. When I was here in the fall, it was a cold, misty, rainy day when I visited Dune Castle. It looks so much less ominous. It's so much more majestic and promising in the sunlight. They're still doing a lot of restoration to the castle, which is good to see knowing that it's being preserved for future generations, a lot more than what was being done when I was here in the fall. Here in the courtyard, you can see a lot more scaffolding. I don't think this was there when I was there last fall. The weather was great, and you could see for, for quite a distance from the top of the castle. Direction, towards the direction where you come in, where the bathrooms are, you can see the town of Dune off in the distance. This is where Claire from Outlander had walked at the end of season one. How she was able to walk without tripping over all the different levels, I'll never know. It's still under restoration as it was in the fall. Many historic locations are experiencing what they call the Outlander effect, where if it was featured in Outlander, it's now become a major tourist destination. And that's how they're able to afford many of the renovations that they're doing. The next three photos are from where the Laird would have sat almost like a courtroom. It was his room of business where he would have settled disputes between tenants and also presided over court cases against those who had committed crimes. The room next door, which I has not shown, served as a temporary holding cell. This great hall was also used in the TV series Game of Thrones. The lead characters sat down at the far end of the great hall in where that chair is or throne was placed. Something I hadn't noticed the last time I was here were these gargoyles on the side of the building. I thought they were rather impressive. One thing you shouldn't miss is the creek at the bottom of the hill. In Outlander, this is where Leary throws herself at Jamie and bares her breasts. It's only down the hill from the castle if you're facing the castle, it will be off to your left. Walk towards the left, towards the tree line, and you'll see a path that takes you down to the creek. It's not to be missed. It's very beautiful. Our next stop was in Falkirk, at the famous Kelpies. They never disappoint. You don't often see this. A wall with the inscription, Stretch up your long necks to face the sun. It's just off to the right as you're walking up the path next to the highway. One of the most amazing things I find about the Kelpies is that they always seem to change. You change an angle, they just seem to change in personality. It, they're never quite the same twice in a row. It's really an interesting thing to see. And you can never quite tell the scale of them until you stand next to them. Just that change of angle changes how they look. Our next stop was on the Hope Tune Estate, Mid-Hope Castle. 
known to Outlander fans as Lollybrock. It's important to remember that houses on either side of the ruins, yes, the ruins, there's not actually a house there. It's an empty shell and there's no floors. The houses on either side are currently occupied, so be kind, be quiet, and be respectful of the private residences. They'll thank you for it. Just like at Dune Castle, some of the nature scenes were filmed right next to Midhope Castle. Just as you come up to the drive, if you look to the right, you'll see a muddy path that leads down next to the creek. This is where Jamie's cave was located during season three. It's also where the next mishap on my trip started. This is the last good picture I had that day on my good camera. For some reason, after this, every one I took had a pink dot in the center. From what I found online, it said that the sensor had been compromised by the sun, so it would no longer work. The rest of the pictures I took with my iPhone, so the quality may be a little different. Our next stop was at the ruins of Lithingo Palace in Lithingo, West Lothian, Scotland. It's about 15 miles west of Edinburgh. It was one of the principal residents of the monarchs of Scotland in the 15th and 16th century, as it was located halfway between Edinburgh and Stirling. What they would do is they would travel from Edinburgh or Stirling to the other city and stop here halfway. For Outlander, it served as Wentworth Prison, with its doors and some of the corridors used as the setting for the prison. These are the doors where Claire had come out after begging the governor for forgiveness for Jamie. Right next door is St. Michael's Church, with its crown on the top of the spire. You have to pass through their courtyard in order to drive out. However, there was a wedding going on at the time. We had to wait in the courtyard in the van about a half an hour or so while they took pictures on those steps. But when we drove out, we drove right by the wedding party and I was able to wish the bride congratulations. It's the first time I ever crashed a wedding. Our next stop and final stop of the day on the tour was Blackness Castle, which stood in for Fort William in the TV show Outlander. Outlander is not far from the village of Blackness. And in Outlander, this is where Jamie had received the lashes from Black Jack Randall. It's also where his father, Brian, died of a heart attack after watching his son suffer. Later in the season, Jamie bl breaks into Blackness Castle, maybe through that door, in order to rescue Claire from Black Jack. This is the approximate location of where that scaffold would have been located during the filming of Outlander. It's one of the cannon ports, and it also shows how thick the walls of this castle were. Prisoners would be kept in this pit. The thing is, with the, it's at low tide, but as the tide would come in, not only would the rats come in, but also the water. It was a cold, miserable place to be held. We were lucky. There were very few other visitors when we were there. It was at the end of the day, and while it had been warm during the day, the sun was starting to go down, and it got windy and chilly. It made me miss my jacket that I had packed. Oh, wait, I did pack one but it was in my luggage that was lost. Blackness Castle was built on the site of a former fort by Sir George Crichton in the 1440s. He was a member of the very important Crichton family. At the time, Blackness was the main port serving Lithingo. This would have been the original stone that stood over the door, denoting when the castle had been built by the Crichton family. The funny thing was, King James II of Scotland in 1453 liked the castle so much he t basically took the castle from the Crichton family and has been in the hands of Crown property ever since. It was later used as a prison. The interesting thing was, if you were an a prisoner of importance, not only was were you a prisoner, your entire family would be kept in the tower with you. The most important political prisoners would be kept in the upper levels with beds, fireplaces, and staff. If you were a lower level prisoner, you'd be kept in the basement where it was cold and damp and you'd have very little rations. These next photos are what it would have been of the higher class 
area where they would have been kept in the tower. Blackness Castle is often referred to as the ship that never sailed due to its size, its shape, and the fact that it sits right on the Firth of Forth. These buildings were later used as barracks when the soldiers were garrisoned here when it was used as a prison. Here are some views looking from the top of a castle. Looking out over the Firth of Forth, you can see that there was a nice breeze. You can also see that during low tide, there's no water. So when you think of when Jamie rescued Claire and they jumped from the top of the castle into the Firth of Forth, into the dark and swirling water, he had better hoped that it was high tide or they would have been crashed on the rocks. If you look off in the distance, you can see the new Queen's Ferry Crossing Bridge. That's the White Bridge. Beyond that is the Red Railroad Bridge. Before we were left, we were lucky to catch the bagpiper playing and one of the workers dancing in Celtic style. It was a great treat. <laughs> the end of our tour for the day with Outlandish Journeys. We retired to our hotel, the Holiday Inn Express, and Leith. We called the airline to see if they had found our bags, and this is what they told us. We know where Christie's bag is, but we still have not found your bag. We can tell you, however, we're going to have it shipped through Gatwick Airport so that you will have it tomorrow afternoon. We'll be sure to send it by courier to your hotel and you will have it by tomorrow afternoon, so don't worry. To which we replied, we have no clothes, no toiletries, and we need a coat. It got very chilly in the evening, and it was due to be chilly in the morning. We're from Florida. We're not used to the 50s. What were we to do? So originally, they offered us 100 British pounds to buy supplies for what we needed. I've replied that if we needed a coat, a change of clothes, and toiletries, a hundred pounds wasn't going to get us very far. So they agreed and increased the amount to 250 pounds. We were lucky. The Ocean Terminal Mall, where the Royal Yacht Britannia is moored, is just across the street from this hotel. We hurried over. It was 6.15, and to our horror, we found out that the mall closed at 7. So we rushed to H&M, and I managed to find a pair of jeans, some shirts, and pajamas. But sadly, they did not have underwear above a size 16. So my friend Christy ran to another store to look for those, while I ran to Boots Pharmacy across the way to get the toothbrush and toothpaste we needed. What a crazy, crazy day. After that, we went and found a restaurant. We went back to Frankie and Benny's, where I'd been in the fall. I got this really great macaroni and cheese with pulled pork. After that, we also went for more comfort food because we went to Starbucks and got a frappuccino before we headed back to the room to turn in. We had an early day the next morning with lots more adventures. So stay tuned for our third day of our Scotland adventure. You might even get to see a celebrity because we did. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click that subscribe button and if you want to know every time I upload, click the bell so you can be notified.